Today we're checking out a brand new E-mount lens from Sony, the 16-35 f4G, a powered ultra-wide lightweight zoom lens designed for video acquisition. Let's check it out. This is Sony's sixth powered zoom lens now, but this new one does stand out from the crowd in a few ways, and it's Sony's first full-frame one in this smaller powered zoom form factor. The Sony Vario Tessar 16-35mm f4 came out all the way back in 2014, and it's been a pretty solid solution for a while now for people using E-mount native lenses, not wanting to pay the high price of the G Master f2.8 version. But it's starting to show its age now versus some more modern optics on the market. This new lens is definitely more aimed at the video shooter than stills, but can easily be used for both. With a price tag of £1300 including VAT, this is where it sits compared to some other lenses in its category. Sony were kind enough to send us the lens for two days to try out, which meant production was tight to get all of the testing done we wanted to. We've managed to shoot a few creative example shots, so you can get a feel for the kind of imagery you can expect out of this lens. Let us know what you think of the footage down in the comments below. The new lens features 13 elements and 12 groups and is built from engineering plastic, which offers a good balance of weight and durability. It weighs just 353 grams, which is very light, but I really wouldn't want to see what a drop onto a hard floor would do to the housing. This low weight coupled with the fact that the lens has internal zooming and focusing will make it a great option for gimbal use, or even with DJI's Ronin 4D system, hopefully DJI add this to their approved list of lenses. It would of course be great for a lightweight run and gun or travel kit as well, where weight is an important consideration. Sony has also stated that the lens is dust and moisture resistant, so not 100% weatherproof. There is no focal length or focus distance markings on the lens, instead, they are both fed out onto the camera's display, but we will explore this a bit more in a bit. There's actually a bunch of buttons and control on the lens. You have three rings, the front is focus, the second is zoom, and the third is to control your aperture. This aperture ring allows you to go into an auto mode, which basically means you are giving control of the aperture ring to the camera, which could be manual via the camera instead of the lens or an auto mode. You can also de-click it with this switch, which is great for video users who want smooth aperture changes. Otherwise, it offers third stop clicky increments. There is also a focus hold button, which you can customize in camera, and a focus mode switch to go between manual and autofocus. Lastly, you have the zoom rocker, which controls the powered zoom. This is similar to the previously powered zooms from Sony, so if you are used to using any of them, you'll be right at home on this new lens. It is an adaptive rocker, so you can control the speed of the zoom with the amount you move it in a given direction. The powered zoom is definitely a big feature on this lens. But if you're coming from a more traditional zoom lens, it may be a bit odd as the zoom is powered via motors. This means no hard stops when zooming, and it also means the lens needs power to do anything at all. You also have the ability to control the speed you can zoom in the camera menu. This can be controlled in a few different ways. With any powered E-mount camera, you can easily control it via the zoom ring or via the rocket on the lens, obviously. With some of the more modern E-mount camera bodies, you can also choose which direction the zoom ring operates. On the a7S III, Alpha 1, a7 IV, FX3, and ZVE10, you can control the zoom operation by setting it to an assignable button, and you can set two different speed settings as well, one for standby and one for recording. With the FX3 and ZVE10, you can use the built-in zoom rockers as well, and when attached to the FX6 and the FX9, you can control the zoom via the rockers on the top handle, as well as the rocker on the main right-hand grip that comes with these cameras. You can tweak the speed of the zoom for the top rock on the FX6 we have here with us. It will also be able to be controlled with compatible zoom demands such as Sony's RM1BP blank controller. You can also enable clear image zoom which will allow you to zoom in further than the optical limitations of the lens while also using these zoom methods we have discussed. Zoom can also be controlled via Sony's Bluetooth remote, the grip for the ZVE10 
and via Sony's app. These are some really great options to have in case you don't have physical access to the camera but need to change the focal length, such as for a live event or a one-man band multi-camera shoot. Sony has also improved the close focus over their two previous 16 to 35s. This new lens focuses down to 28 centimeters at the wide end and then 24 centimeters at the tele end, which I found kind of odd as with most other tele zooms with different close focuses, they are normally closer at the wider end of their zoom range. Sony doesn't provide an exact image circle for the lens, but it has clearly been designed to be used with full frame E-mount cameras. So we can assume that it has been designed for a regular 36 by 24 millimeter full frame sensor which means it should have a rated image circle of roughly 43.467 millimeters. With the lens being E-mount, we can't conduct our regular coverage tests. However, I wanted to illustrate how light changes across your frame as you zoom on the lens and just generally look at how it performs. We filmed the zoom test on the Venice and the a7 IV and took some stills using the 3x2 mode of our a7 IV. We used a similar testing method to the one used on our lens tool, which you can check out on our website. This meant that we shot tests at 16, 20, 24, 28 and 35 millimeters at f4 and at f5.6, at close focus and at infinity. For the light difference between the two, we adjusted our shutter speed, so any light change is the lens changing the amount of light as settings are kept consistent. At 16 millimeters, we can see a touch of hard vignette in the corners of frame, which is worse at f4 than f5.6, and worse at infinity than close focus. 5.6 does perform much better at 16 millimeters, and you will see some vignetting when shooting brighter areas in the corners of frame. Fortunately, in video mode shooting in 16 by nine, you will not see any of this harder vignetting. Performance from 20 mm onwards to 35 mm is pretty consistent though, with only a very minor drop off of illumination towards the corners across all of our tests. So if you're using this lens on a full frame sensor in its three x two mode, you want to be shooting more towards 20 mm than 16, if you want better coverage in the corners of the frame. But like I said, in its 16 by nine mode, I wouldn't worry about the drop off in the corners. Before getting into the rest of the tests, I wanted to mention distortion first. You will really want to make sure that distortion correction is turned on with whatever camera you are using this lens with. With the a7S III that we shot these tests on, we shot both RAW and JPEG stills, as well as a video clip zooming through the range. We can see how the lens performs without this correction enabled if we look at the RAW images in Lightroom without using the lens profile which at the time of recording isn't available. You can see just how much it suffers from distortion throughout the range, but as soon as you toggle on the correction, things look much, much better. When in video mode, this correction is baked in, which is good. With the correction on, performance is very good throughout the range. However, when compared to the older 16 to 35, with both of their corrections off, the new lens does suffer from much more distortion throughout its range, especially when compared at the wider end. Luckily, this isn't a massive deal as pretty much every E-mount camera I can really see this lens being used on will have lens correction profiles built in to fix this. For our bokeh, flare and chart tests, we shot on our Sony Venice, which doesn't have the same lens correction feature that the Alpha and FX line have. This means that all of these tests will be showing both this new lens and the older Zeiss 16-35 uncorrected. Sorry, but we only figured this out after we had shot them and returned the lens back to Sony. Anyway, Let's check out some bokeh. Before we get into the rest of the tests, we've uploaded a full uncut test video on our Vimeo where you can watch everything uncut if you really want to deep dive into the performance of the lens. One thing that we noticed while testing the lens is that at 16 millimeters at f4, you can see the aperture blades forming the iris. And as you zoom, you can see these slowly opening up until 35 millimeters where there are no blades visible. This isn't abnormal with stills lenses. And really the main reason why brands do this is for marketing purposes, as it allows companies to market their lenses as constant f-stop zooms by doing this little bit of trickery. Personally, I would rather this trend went away, as I think getting every bit of light out of a lens possible would be far better for the end user. And if you need a constant f4 zoom, you can just stop down and you have it. This older 16-35 also has the same method of using the aperture blades at the wider end to give the lens a constant aperture. For these tests, we wanted to see how it looked compared to the older 16-35 Sony Zeiss lens, which also has a seven blade circular aperture. Starting at 16 mm the new lens at f4 has a little bit of CA around the edges of our outer focus highlights, but not loads. Shape is all right, but not perfectly circular in the center of the frame. At 5.6, it looks very similar. You can see a little bit of texture in the highlight, 
and that the highlight has a defined edge to it, which we can see consistently all the way to the longer focal lengths of the lens, where it's a bit more prevalent, but it's not as strong as the older version of the lens. At 20mm, we can see a similar performance to 16mm. At 24mm, we can see shape getting a little bit weird, kind of wobbly. We can also see some misshapen bokeh towards the corners of frame. At 28mm, we can see similar performance to 24mm, but with slightly exaggerated texture and misshapen highlights towards the corners of frame. At 35mm, we can see the best shape highlights in the middle of frame, but they do still look a little wobbly when at 5.6. When we compare the bokeh between the new and the old lens, the new lens performs much better in my opinion, due to its better overall shape and much less texture. But this could come down to personal preference. When it comes to flare, this new lens performs really well. It's really well controlled and I actually think it looks quite nice. But flare is incredibly subjective. It's also really consistent across the different focal lengths, but you can see some minor differences if you look hard enough. I don't want to put the full test here, so if you want to see full uncut examples of the flare tests, I've put a link to our video of them on our Vimeo in the description below. For our sharpness and CA test, we shot our regular focus chart with our Sony Venice. Both of the lenses were shot at f4 and f5.6. We will cram as many shots as we can into the video here, but for full tests, they are also on Vimeo. The camera was in the exact same position for each focal length across both lenses, so any field of view change between the two is the lens, not the position of the camera or the chart. At 16mm, performance is good on the new PZ lens with good resolving power across the frame. The older lens has more CA across the frame with a touch less resolving power. Corner performance on the newer lens does improve when you stop down to 5.6, and that's also the case with the older lens. At 20mm, there is a clear difference between the two lenses. The new PZ zoom resolves much better in the center of frame at f4 and has less CA in the corners of the frame. At f5.6, both bite up quite a bit, but the difference still stands. At 24mm, performance is similar to the 20mm, but I think the older lens performs a little bit worse than at 20mm here. The new PZ performs well here and the older lens suffers from CA in the corners of frame. At 28mm, the lenses have similar resolution performance, but the older lens has more CA, especially in the corners. At 35mm, there again is a big difference between the two lenses. The PZ is much better across the frame than the older lens. It resolves better and has less aberration. So in conclusion, this new PZ outperforms the older Zeiss 16-35, but that isn't surprising. This new lens performs well. I just wish I had a G Master 16-35 2.8 to compare it to as well. This lens has been designed primarily for run and gun video. No focus and focal length markings on the lens barrel should show you that. If you want to know what focal length and focus distance you are at, you will need to look at your camera's monitor. On the FX6, FX9 and Venice, both of these appear on the main recording screen, and you can tweak if the focus scale is imperial or metric. On the Alpha series cameras and the FX3, it's a bit different. You can see focal length on the home shooting screen in all modes. However, to see a focus distance and a focus scale, you need to be in the camera's stills mode. When in video mode, this doesn't show up, which is annoying as arguably this is more important to have in the video mode than in the stills mode. Hopefully this is something that Sony can change with firmware. The lens features Sony's XD linear motors, which means it is focused by wire, which again isn't surprising. From our testing, the focus throw looks to be somewhere around the 140-ish degree range, which is pretty good, and the throw also looks pretty linear. However, it does seem to have quite a large buffer for infinity when using it on an A7S III, which could give the illusion that it has a non-linear throw. Autofocus performance is just as fantastic as you would expect from a modern Sony E-mount lens. It performs excellently when on the modern E-mount cameras we have tested it on. This is great, as I can see it being put onto gimbals by lots of people. The new 16-35 PZ is actually pretty parfocal. This is awesome given the lens's price point. However, it isn't the longest focal range, but it's great nonetheless. For this example, we focused at the tail end in manual focus on our Sony Venice and then zoomed in and out. You can see how well it holds focus as you zoom through the focal range. This is great to have while manual focusing. and means that when paired with the lens being an AF, you will have super sticky autofocus as you zoom on still subjects as your autofocus isn't having to correct for focus shifts. If you've watched any of our previous lens reviews, you'll have often heard the word breathing. Breathing is a term used to describe the slight focal length change that can happen when moving through a lens's focus range. 
is a characteristic that is common in stills lenses as it is something that will not be noticed when capturing a single frame. But with moving image, it can be seen as distracting. So most cine lenses are optically designed to minimize focus breathing. However, like a lot of optical imperfections, this could be a desired effect in some situations. Throughout the range, the lens performs incredibly well in this regard. There is very minimal breathing throughout the focal range, which is great for such a video focused lens. With the a7 IV, Sony introduced a new lens breathing compensation mode, which is now also out on the FX6. With this enabled, the lens has no breathing at all, but you will have a slight crop on your image. This lens really is going to be very popular with anyone invested in the E-mount ecosystem whose main goal is shooting video. It has excellent optical performance, is incredibly compact and lightweight, and having the ability to control the zoom remotely and on the camera body smoothly will make it the go-to ultra-wide for this market, especially for run and gun filmmakers who want a lightweight, good ultra-wide general zoom. I'm sure it's also going to be very popular with vloggers and YouTubers wanting an ultra-wide lens that would work in a piece of camera setup and then out and about vlogging. One thing you may be thinking is, ooh, but it's f4, I want it to be f2.8, and I get it. You want that lovely bokeh. However, I would argue that Sony's decision to make it f4 was a smart one, as it allows them to keep the weight and size down. Realistically, you're most likely going to have the lens stop down when this wide anyway, and in low light situations, chances are if you are using this on a modern E-mount camera, like the a7S III or any of the FX cameras, the cameras are so sensitive now, you can easily shoot at f4 in lighting conditions that with older cameras would require f2.8. But of course, there will be people who will demand f2.8, and you have options for that. It will also make a great gimbal lens because of its good wide focal range and the Ronin's ability to control optical zoom via the focus wheel with compatible Sony cameras. It could also end up being a great pairing with the Ronin 4D because of its compact and lightweight design, internal zoom and focus mechanics, and control which could be possible with an updated firmware from DJI. Hopefully DJI will update their firmware ASAP so this can work with the 4D. I really hope Sony decides to do this with more lenses, as a 24-70 in this style of housing would be awesome. Let us know what you think of the Sony 16-35mm f4 powered zoom in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and maybe even consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.